Welcome to the Jerusalem Lights Podcast with Rabbi Chaim Richman, whose goal is Torah for everyone. I'm your co-host, Jim Long. And now, Rabbi Chaim Richman. Shalom, Jim. Is that you? Is that you on the other side of, of the Atlantic? Shalom, Rabbi. I'm back here in the, the Ozarks, and uh, we, there is a great gulf between us called the Atlantic Ocean. But somehow, I miss, you. I miss you. Your beautiful visit that you had here to the land of Israel, where we sat side by side, and and our podcast was was uh, preceded by a, a wonderful luncheon that I gave you, and and uh, and here you are back back in the Ozarks again. Yeah. Well, I'm going to come back, Bezrat Hashem, as soon as I can. But uh, it, it's never enough time to spend in the good land. It never is. You know, but I, I got yeah, off the plane. Yeah. And the world is in a different place. It seems like, what the is world going is on, Rabbi? On, on its side, it's it is uh, absolutely incomprehensible to me. It is so uh, horrific. The innocent people that are that are being slaughtered, this loss of life, and um, what it means for the mm. whole world. How the world is reaction is is reacting is another whole subject. I can't imagine that anything would ever be the same. Um, it's yeah. it's absolutely unspeakable. As you've told me that, that there is a distinct and and dramatic connection between this these events and and this week's parsha. That it's so elegant and so beautiful. I think that it behooves us uh, as students of Torah and as lovers of Hashem that we always look to Torah for some sort of um, not explanation or connection, but for some sort of guidance. And mm-hmm. the fact is, as everybody knows, the, the weekly Torah readings are not haphazard. It's not random. There is a certain kind of divine orchestration that we find uh, in, in the way the readings fall out because it's the Torah is literally the story of of man, and it's our story. It's being told right now. We are we are part of that story. So it's not ancient history. And uh, often we see a, a stark connection between uh, unfolding events and and what we're reading in the, in the weekly Torah portion. And I personally feel a huge. Um, kind of um, resonance between what we are reading about now and what's going on in the world in a, in a different kind of way, because the, the, the Torah portion of Pikude, which we are reading this week, which is the final concluding Torah portion of the book of Exodus, is all about the completion of the tabernacle. Even the root word pakod, to, to call to account, to not Pikude, just... Pikudeh, right. It means reckoning. It means ac- accounts. Yeah. And I, and I really I see that, that going on. I, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I, I know I know where you're going. I just want to explain to our our listeners that the the Torah portion, ostensibly, the majority of it is uh, is actually it's kind of like a, a receipt booklet because mm-hmm. it's you know in this is the fifth Torah portion that is all about the tabernacle, which is amazing. Yeah, it's been such a major theme in the Book of Exodus. In Parshat Truma, Moshe was on Mount Sinai hearing all of this from Hashem, getting all of the details and all of the commandments of, of the tabernacle. And, and then uh, so too in Parsha Titzaveh and in Kitisa, he came down and confronted the people with a golden calf and went back up and, and we had the first Yom Kippur. And then Vayakel, last week's Torah portion, Moshe assembled the whole people and gave them the assignment to go out, to bring the materials, to construct the tabernacle. And then in this week's Torah portion of Pikude, it's, the accounting, the reckoning of all of the materials that were used to construct the tabernacle. So the the obviously the details here and the reckoning and the transparency is extremely important to Hashem. We're poised on the the possible, you know, I hate to say the word annihilation, and yet the 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 reckoning that Moshe even went through to say, look, I'm going to open the books and show you. I've not taken one thing, and I have. I've been a responsible leader. I've been responsible in every aspect of completing this task, and this this calls to mind the idea. I think for us as 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 people who embrace Torah, that God is is asking the leaders of this world right now, if if you are ready to to defend what's going on 
in in the Ukraine. If you're if you're ready to um, take action, we, we first need to take an account ourselves and see where we stand. Are we capable? Are we honest in our approach to this um, to this actual uh, event? And um, I, I think we're taking a strong look ourselves. The way the people looked at Moshe and Moshe was able to respond uh, by, by being, again, to use the word transparent and to respond in a very positive way. Uh, I don't see how any, any individual, how any person, how any people or governments can not uh, take a very strong position on, on what's going on. It's, it's something that um, it changes the world, absolutely changes the world. And I don't even know where to start. You know, um, uh, again, in this week's Torah portion, the completion of the tabernacle at the end of the, towards the end of the portion, towards the end of chapter 39, is compared to the completion of the world itself. And the verses that we read at the end of chapter 39, you know, like everything that Hashem commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel perform all the labor. Moses saw the entire work, and behold, they had done it as Hashem had commanded, so they had done, and Moshe blessed them. It's so similar to the verses in the Genesis narrative in, in chapter 2 of, of Brishit, how Hashem saw that everything that he had done was good, and 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 he blessed the seventh day. The but the parallel is clear because the tabernacle backslash mikdash sanctuary is considered to be like a microcosm, like a, a template for for the whole universe. And that leads us to the idea, which I think is so pertinent for what's going on in the world today. It can't be for naught that the Torah itself emphasizes and our sages explain and amplify that the tabernacle, the temple is the secret of of peace, so much so that in addition to all the, the visions of the prophets, like Isaiah, who tells us that the whole world will be united as one and will come up to the Holy Temple to learn the ways of Hashem, and you have uh, something like the um, prophet Haggai in chapter uh, 2 and verse 9, who tells us that Hashem literally says, in this place, I will grant peace. But again, it's not like some sort of alchemy. You know, it's not magic. Mm -hmm. It's not like some sort of, oh, because we, we put this structure up, all of a sudden there's peace. It, it has to do with what the temple does for people, for, for the, how it enhances the human condition, how it encourages people to delve deeply into themselves because of the very visceral um, experience that they have in the temple wherein they have to confront the foibles of their own humanity and they have to, and they have to address uh, those things that are holding them back from uh, becoming the people that they were meant to be. The, it, the temple helps us take the work in progress of our own humanity and bring it uh, to the best place possible. And that's exactly what's missing from the world when everybody is totally out for themselves and everything is, is completely um, kind of like... Uh, just, out of order, uh, maybe? Uh, out, out of order, and yeah. the prevalent feeling is one of this universal angst that's so prevalent and and and, and uh, permeating, you know, kind of like this, this spiritual despair and I believe it's because, uh, as Torah teaches us, it's it's a question of the concealment of the divine presence, and and that's what the temple addresses again, as emphasized by our our Torah portion here, and these verses that show us the parallel between the completion of the tabernacle and the universe itself. It's about the revelation of Hashem's presence in in day to day life, which is not is not something that people are are able to connect with today. God has a plan. I mean, the Mishkan could not have been built without a plan, without a blueprint. We have these promises here embedded in this that connect to the prophecies that God is that God is going to build a house of prayer for all nations with as a co-creative project with the people of Israel and the nations that we have a future. You know, as, as bleak as this might look, is that we might actually be on the brink of nuclear annihil annihilation. Uh, Ouch. The world is not going to end, folks. We, we, might, we might have some, some skirmishes. We might have, I don't know, you know, the prophets even talk about things that sound like nuclear war. But the thing about those kinds of prophecies 
is is this is an amazing thing that people may not realize. Hazal, the sages tell us, don't they, Rabbi, that that prophecies of terrible things do not have to, they can be nullified, can't they? Exactly. It depends on our largely on our behavior, and this is right. the way we we spoke about this a lot when we were talking about Mashiach. The idea, this is how we understand various contradictory verses about the entrance of Mashiach and the time in which mm-hmm. he appears. It's 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 a promise that Hashem made, but how it comes about, whether on time or you know on the default or before or or early, whether it's pleasant or or fraught with suffering is is about how we are found deserving yeah and by the same token and this is so wonderful the prophecies which are promises the prophecies that that promise good like the building of the of the third temple those cannot be nullified that's right jim and as we mentioned in in a previous uh, episode when we were talking about the times of mashiach um there's a tradition that our sages have that they actually put in these very words that the generation in which and here's a comfort here this is this is a good thing believe it or not that the, that the generation that Mashiach comes in is going to be so technologically advanced that it, and this is the expression that they use that it will be capable of bringing about its own destruction. Mm-hmm. So just a couple of hours ago today, before we started recording, uh, I, I saw a news item that the that the Russian foreign minister. This was very, I found it very disturbing because I didn't get any explanation of why he said it exactly, what it was connected to. But the Russian foreign minister made a statement that World War Three is going to be nuclear. Ouch. So I don't know why Putin has his has his you know gave a gave an order that their nuclear uh, system has to be on high alert now. Oh my goodness, back to the Mishkan for a moment, if we can go back and forth between sure. these levels of reality. You mentioned the plan. You mentioned the divine plan for, for the temple. That's that's amazing that you said that because you know, for for a while we've been studying on Sundays in in our Zoom classes, we've been studying the, the book of First Samuel. And in the book of First Samuel, we've been studying about how you know uh, David was escaping from King Saul. And in chapter 19 of Samuel the first. We read in verse 18 that David fled and escaped and came to Samuel at Ramah uh, and told him all that Saul had done to him. And so he and Samuel went and stayed at Nayot. And so they they were up all night in a place called Nayot. And according to our sages, there was a lot going on. It was very, very amazing that Samuel was giving over to David all the secrets of the Holy Temple, giving him the mandate of preparing for the temple. Of course, it was Solomon, his son, who built it, but he was he gave over to him a special part of the Torah called Megillat HaMikdash, the Temple Scroll, which included all the plans for, for literally the blueprints for how the temple is to be built. But the sages point out something amazing, and those who are students of Torah will understand this idea because it it happens occasionally in, in Torah when we study and there are all sorts of special codes and allusions and red flags and different different uh, levels of meaning that, it, that makes Torah study so compelling and fascinating. But the point is the verse tells us that they were in a place called Nayot. And then the sages go and they tell us there's no such place. Well, there's no such place as Nayot. The word itself is an illusion to the to the fact that they were studying and preparing for the holy temple because it comes from a word meaning to beautify yeah. meaning beautiful why because they were occupying themselves with that which beautifies the world which makes the world whole which brings peace to the world which is the holy temple so again for for the, for the world to be uh, seemingly coming apart all around us during the weeks in which we are completing this five part series of Torah readings about the, about Hashem's dream, as it were, about mm-hmm. his goal to be welcomed by man into this world to be to for, for the tabernacle to be built is is so amazing. And not only that, but again, tonight is Rosh Chodesh, it's the new moon of the second month of Adar. And we know that the whole concept of this month of Adar is about the concealment of the divine presence and revealing it because, because, you know, the whole theme of the month really ta- is it's crescendo is Purim. And as everybody knows, Purim is the story of this terrible decree that Israel found itself facing in the, in the lands of Ahasuerus, right? And Hashem was, as it were, nowhere to be found. 
And that's why when we when we read the book of Esther, the scroll of Esther, Megillat Esther, it's the only book of the whole Tanakh in which Hashem's name inexplicably is not even to be found. Mm-hmm. It's the only book of the Bible that does not have God's name in it. Yeah. And yet his presence was everywhere. But when we read the story, it seems like a, a whole bunch of random events that are disconnected. You know, Mordechai was sitting in the gate of the king and he heard this conversation between two would-be assassins and he wouldn't bow down to Haman and all these things. And then Esther was taken and she found herself in the palace of all places, a Jewish girl is in the palace with Achashverosh. And so all these seemingly disassociated, disconnected random events were part of a tremendous weave of tapestry. In fact, there's a beautiful idea that the word rikma, which literally means tapestry, that when you look at a tapestry, you see all sorts of different scenes in it, right? And it's only yeah. when you step back that you can see the whole, let's say you're looking right at, or you're standing right in front of one piece of the tapestry and all you see is that one scene. But if you step back, you can see the whole panorama. The same word, of course, this is part of the beauty of, of Hebrew, the same word rikma, the letters are rearranged and it spells another word, mikre, which means coincidence, yeah. happenstance. In other words, if you, if, you, if you think something is a coincidence when you look at that one thing as an isolated incident, but when you step back and you see the divine providence, you see Hashem's orchestration of everything, then you understand it's part of something much, much greater. So the thing about, about this month of Adar, as everybody knows, is that it's, it symbolizes the absolute epitome, the paragon of joy. You know, Purim is a, the most joyous time because we were delivered and Hashem made his presence felt, even though it was unseen. But the truth is that that's the, the real secret of joy is that we feel Hashem is not in our lives. We feel his presence is hidden. We feel that he's distant from us. And actually, he's very, very close. Yeah. And, With- and by the way, one other, one other thought about Adar I just want to tell you mm-hmm. is that when you look at the word Adar, which is three letters, which is the name of this month, it can actually be broken up into Aleph, Dar, Aleph, and Dalad Reish. Dar, you just came from Israel. You know that Adira is an apartment. Sure. Right? So that, so it, the root of that word means to dwell, to live. And so the idea, the theme, the goal of this month of bringing Hashem's presence into the world, of recognizing Hashem's presence, especially as it as it coincides with the, with the Torah portions of the tabernacle, it's for Hashem to have a place in this world because he is the alufo shalolam. He is the aleph. He is the, the one of this world. And it's about him being in this world. Yeah. And all of this, I think, I think relates in the most remarkable way to uh, the terrible events that we're witnessing. Because, because the act of war and the act of, of brutal and, 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 and horrific attack on, on life is like, Trying to expel God from the world, and you know the other the other parallel in the story in the Megillah Esther, the story of Esther, is the fact that the the ruler of Persia was basically uh, not completely sane. I notice in the news that there's a lot of speculation in uh, in by world uh, leaders and governments and intelligence agencies and and commentators about Putin's mental state about his. Yeah, his, that's um, that's in question. Where's he but, at exactly? I want to. I, can I? Can I return to that remarkable uh, account that you shared with us about David and the prophet talking? There, the, he is on the brink of possibly losing everything. David is. He, he's he's under attack, and yet he sits down with the prophet, and they're talking about the future. And that, to me, shows the tremendous faith that these two men had. That that these things were. In in that tapestry that you talked about, in that tapestry of of events, were really kind of minor compared to the real task, which was once they got these resolved, they were going to get on to setting up and preparing so that his son could build the temple. And I think that that's we can draw comfort from that in the fact that what is the half Torah for this week's parsha? The Haftorah is the story of the the completion of the Beit HaMikdash by King Solomon, the son of David. And I think that we should look at this in the same way in that 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 the um, that this connection that you've drawn between this this vehicle for peace in the world, which will be the Beit HaMikdash, is that we have that as a promise that uh, that's that still looms. 
for us in the future. It's so disturbing to see uh, so much human suffering. You know, uh, there's now at this point close to a million people that, that are already um, displaced, uh, refugees. You know, the history of, of the Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish people is not simple. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult and, and dark history. But the fact is, uh, how can anyone um, sit by and see uh, innocent people suffering? It's, it's absolutely unspeakable what's going on. It's also quite fascinating, actually, that, that uh, Ukraine, which, which uh, has a rather anti-Semitic history, now has a Jewish president yeah. who, is, is, uh, who has turned into an iconic uh, folk hero on the level of the Maccabees. He refuses to leave his people. Yeah, you know, uh, refuses to be extricated, dons a, a flak jacket, and goes out uh, uh, with his people. So, uh, and and by the way, I understand that that Putin has hired uh, top uh, mercenaries to come and assassinate him. As you pointed out, there's a troubling history of of the Ukrainian people in the past, and that that is the operative word in the past, uh, not treating the Jewish people quite so well, and that's an understatement. But but this again is Hashem reminding us of His own Torah that says in Deuteronomy twenty four sixteen that fathers shall not be put to death uh, for their children's acts, nor shall the children uh, for their fathers' actions. We're, we're judged by each of us is judged by Hashem and by by the the, the court of heaven, uh, and we're even asked to do this in our own courts. To say that the. Uh, the history, how you put it, that the history is not, it's, that was a, a very big understatement because the history is, is very, very difficult and scarred. But it's totally impertinent and sensitive to judge the current day people for the sins of their grandfathers. And the Amen. fact is, Amen. Um, the goal, uh, and it's difficult, it's difficult for the Jewish people because the scars are very, very deep and because the atrocities that were committed by Ukrainians in the, in the Holocaust on behalf of the Nazis were worse than any other European country. And the sheer amounts of Jews that were murdered within days, just at Babi Yar alone, you know, almost 34,000 Jews were murdered in, in, in a day and a half at, at Babi Yar by, by Ukrainians on behalf of the Nazis. But the fact is the goal of a Torah mentality, you know, I, f I find it so important when people are judgmental. No one can speak for Hashem and say that you know this is God's revenge on the Ukrainians because women and children and innocent people don't and and, and no person deserves that. And so the idea is, you know that um, that that kind of thinking I I totally invalidate and there, and we must under, we must realize and understand that that our goal as as people created in Hashem's image is to reach the point where we are truly able to feel an affinity with every person and to feel, you know, a diminishment and to feel a pain by the suffering and loss of any human life. And that's the, the true meaning of what it means to love one's neighbor as oneself is to, is to be able to understand that, that, that Hashem's plan for all humanity is ultimately this unity and this reunion in the whole family of man, which is exactly what Isaiah the prophet talks about when he talks about all nations coming up again to the holy temple. So the, these things are extremely interwoven, all, all of the themes that we're really talking about here, the, the, the hidden presence of Hashem in, in the world, which is personified, you know, uh, which is embodied by the month of Adar and revealing that presence as it was in the story of Purim you know, the building of the tabernacle as being a parallel to the perfection of the universe because man wants Hashem in the world, not because it's magic, not because it's, it's some sort of, you know, a chemical reaction. Oh, we build the tabernacle and all of a sudden everything is fine and Hashem is in the world. No, it's because of what people will will become when they are able to partake in that direct and unfolding experience of that confrontation with themselves in Hashem's eyes of that realization of the reality of Hashem in every aspect of our lives, that the, that the presence of Hashem, if that's felt in the tabernacle and in the temple, emphasizes it, changes everything. <clears throat> and so I, I see that these things are so, are so uh, divinely orchestrated as far as the timing that we're in right now. And, and I think one of the major questions that people have to ask themselves is what they are, how are they reacting? Where do they expect to go from here? Because it's not the same world. Um, that it was uh, before this uh, this, this moment.
Yeah. You know, and I had a very, very upsetting thought. That, you know, I, I don't really know how Putin can ever, um, what is the word, can ever um, just walk walk away from this or, or you know, um, back down from it in a way because he's lost so much international standing. You know, the, the man has become the pariah of the whole world now. No. The, it, it's, it's um, you know, he, he keeps saying that he's not attacking civilian targets. And then we see horrible images of apartment buildings that are being blown up and, uh, and the, the human loss and the, and the suffering and the, and, the, and the exile of so many people and families. And, and, and again, no matter what, how, how scarred anyone's conscious is from the past, you, you cannot look at the faces of a family that's divided, of parents separating from the children that don't know when they're going to see them again, of children going off on their own, you know, marching towards a, the border of another country. You can't see that and not be affected, especially for, as Jews who are, who are, you know, taught that they have to be sensitive to human suffering. So I'm thinking to myself, what, what's with him? You know, what happened to him? And this, I'm not a pundit or a politician or a commentator, and I can't speculate more than the best and the brightest minds about his goals in the Ukraine. But, but what I'm thinking is because he became such a pariah now and because he's been, he's been uh, just, um, you know, he, he's, he's really seen now as, as being a, a monster and, you know, how close is his finger to the button now? You know, is, is that, was that his end game all along or is that going to be like, well, he has nothing to lose. What, I, what I'm trying to say is he's in so deep and he has so alienated himself from the world community and shown that he really doesn't care what anybody thinks and the, and he, and the numbers that are being racked up and the damage that's being caused is, it just seems like it, it, it's, he's in so deep I mean, God forbid, is this, is this it? You know, is that the end game now? Mm. It seems almost like reasonable to think that that's what this is all about because he, he, is just, he is just so far gone. I have been to the Ukraine five times. We're seeing these, you know, like the satellite image now that everyone is looking at of the, the 40 kilometer long convoy of Russian yeah. uh, vehicles that are making their way to Kiev. I know that road. My great grandfather is buried in the Ukraine. Um, my 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 forebears for many generations uh, lived in the Ukraine. I feel like kind of invested in in this because of these of these roots. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, again, the history is so um, dark and uh, and, and um, almost uh, almost unspeakable what the Jewish people went through in the Ukraine. But again, nobody is, nobody is asking me to, to, to declare, uh, uh, you know, Ukrainian history to be sanitized, uh, you know, because they're, they've yet to deal with their role in the Holocaust and they've yet to, to, to come to grips with that. But the fact is it, that's not the point. It's got nothing to do with that. Now, what it has to do with now really is a question of right and wrong. It has to do yeah. with dictators sending in his soldiers to kill to kill innocent people, and yeah. and and uh, that is um, something that cannot be that cannot be uh, not only can't be tolerated, but it can't but one can't be uh, undecided about it because because this is the time that we are called upon to to try and hone the vision of the prophets that was idealized by by the prophets and that was emphasized by all the great leaders of every generation. And that is a united humanity. And so, and so, you know, it's not about ignoring the historical truth. It's about understanding that, that right now it is about um, standing up for, for, for human rights, for human dignity and, uh, and the bravery to, to expose uh, evil and, and, uh, and lies and, and, uh, Immorality and and uh, that's what's basically what's going on here. It's it, it's and to me it seems to be um, a, a very momentous moment in history. As we all know, there are other countries that are in similar situations that are poised to um, to make to apparently to, to to take similar actions that are waiting to see how the world will react. And so it's a time for strong leadership, and it's a time for the world to react. And again, um, 
Zelensky, uh, uh, the Jewish president of a country that has an anti-Semitic history, who himself is uh, uh, the son of a family who lost many members in the Holocaust. The man is, uh, is a, um, an incredible example of heroism in, in our time. Amazing to see this person who no one knew who he was not long ago. He was an, a, an actor, a comedian, and on a lark, as it were, because people said, why not run for president? Because it was so corrupt anyway. And apparently he paid, he played such a person in, in some TV yeah. show and he was, was elected and he is leading his people, at, at least on the level of, of, um, of inspiration and 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 a, a moral standing, he he is basically rallying his his countrymen to uh, to hope. When you're put in a, in a really hard place, then the the true self emerges. And apparently, this Jewish hero, his country is rallying around him. But I think it's sh- it's a reminder that that people that people change, and that people should be judged on on the, their their actions. It's a hope that we can all change. And I certainly it's believe that- It's not our that, call to judge. It's not our call to judge yeah. anyone. It's our call to stand, to stand up for, for um, people's right, right to live uh, mm-hmm. un, unfettered, unhindered. And, and that's, that's what's at stake. Um, it, it, it reminds me of uh, the um, teaching of our sages, you know, that when um, the, peop- the people of Israel were crossing the, the sea, on um, the night of the, the eighth night of Passover, seventh night of Passover, when they, the Jewish people were crossing the sea, the ministering angels, according to the Midrash, wanted to sing praise to Hashem. Right. And Hashem said to them, "How could you? How could you sing praise to me now when my when my handiwork is drowning in the sea?" Referring to the Egyptians who had been so cruel, right, to the Israelites. Um. And I think that that is that is a major uh, theme in Torah, also uh, of uh, uh, understanding this goal of being able to go past our our particular um, idiom and to mm-hmm. understand something on the on the level of a of a, of a universal connection, uh, even with, uh, with 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 people that have been cruel to us. We should pray for, you know, the uh, peaceful outcome to this. And to spare the lives of, you know, obviously the Ukrainians, but but hope that in Russia that that the people of Russia will see the madness that is gripping their leader. Because didn't you tell me that they found a cell phone of a Russian soldier? Uh, Ukrainian forces um, uh, found a smartphone uh, on the body of a of a, a Russian soldier who had been killed, and I think. Maybe it was the ambassador to the Ukraine or some representative in at that extraordinary UN Security Council session that was held, and he was reading the, a text from the phone that the soldier had been texting with his mother, if it's true, allegedly, and the, and the Russian soldier was texting with his mother something like, "This is horrible. They're 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 having us kill civilians. It's not what we were anticipating, right. and it's horrible. I'm in a terrible situation. I don't I don't want to do this. It's wrong." and and you know, there's some kind of idea that um, apparently the Russian soldiers were told that they had the impression that the Ukrainians were going to welcome them with open arms, and instead they're meeting this fierce resistance. But as you said, Jim, there's a Creator in the world who is the eternal Father of all people, and uh, we all need to focus on on this prayer that um, the innocent people are protected, that there is no more. Um, loss of life that those who seek this power and those who, those who seek to destroy are are uh, stopped and that we turn to Hashem as as the as the power of the universe and again the the goal of all of the Torah portions that we're reading is for, is to realign man with God and understand the beauty and the purpose and the singularity and the, the and the holiness of what it means to be a human being Instead, now we see the human, Im- the, the godly image in which man was created. We see it being sullied and tarnished and degraded, and and it is absolutely uh, a terrible time of life for us to be um, witness to. The whole message of today that you really have brought home, and that's this idea that the parsha is pointing to the solution, which is and the outcome is peace. 
that's the most amazing thing about this Parsha is that you would never on the face of it read it and think it was all about world peace. And it is. And you've made that really abundantly clear. Amen. Uh, Amen. So Bezrat Hashem, we should hear good news and we should uh, witness this uh, as some sort of Purim story that it should be a turn a turnabout and it should be a a uh, revelation of Hashem's presence and that uh, people should be safe and and suffering should cease and families should be reunited and uh, that which has been destroyed should be rebuilt and evil should be defeated in all forms and that we should not rejoice uh, over um, the suffering even of, of he who had been an enemy, but that our, our goal ultimately is to see all of human being all, all of human being all humanity raised up and united and and truly um, together in the service of Hashem. That's really what these parshiot are all about. Amen. So uh, so we are um, seeing something unfold now that is totally charged with the destiny for, for all humanity and how we all react, I think, and how not only our leaders and governments, but how each one of us um, ultimately processes this and understands our, our own responsibility towards the family of man. I, I think that's really the key here and the goal. Amen. So Jim Chodesh Tov, we wish uh, all of our listeners a wonderful continuation of the of the magic and majesty of the month of Adar as we enter into the second phase now of the month of joy. May we truly experience joy. May we truly experience the revelation of Hashem's presence in this world, the cessation of suffering, and the total rejection of evil by all people. Amen.